welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Mike and Ian as we reread our favorite books, the Aubrey Matron canon of Patrick O'Brien. Ian just finished up a huge chapter divided in two parts and about to embark on another. Can you catch us up and tell us where we're headed? I can, Mike, and with pleasure. Last time in the second half of Chapter 6, the badly damaged surprise had barely made it through a huge storm, a big blow. Stephen's thoughts had been consumed with Diana until right at the close of the chapter there. He got distracted by this beautiful but deadly sea snake that they caught just as they were coming into Bombay. But the trapped snake, in a whole world of symbolism there, killed itself and lost its colour. This time, in the first half of chapter 7, Stephen wanders round a Bombay that is beyond his imagination. He finds a new particular friend, philosophizes on the holy, on the human, on the meaning of what he reads in Sophie's letters, and on what he and Jack might do, respectively, for love. Wow. So, Mike, it's, it's, it's another great... Great big chapter, and we're going to be taking this one again in two pieces here. We're in Bombay, and we're back into a shore mode, right? We are, we are. You know, we're coming in, and Surprise goes straight into the naval yard and is cleared for the dry dock immediately before she sinks at her mooring. So mm. that's, wow. You know, glad, glad we made it. The Admiral promotes Mr. Hervey. You know, he becomes master and commander of another ship, so Jack, lacking a first lieutenant, has all this refitting work on his shoulders. But to make it up to him, the Admiral opens all the resources of the yard to Captain Aubrey. And we we know Jack set loose (laughs) in (laughs) in the naval supply yard. Ah, And Jack says, okay, no leave until we get all the supplies we need. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't have any other ships coming in here to grab these supplies before we can get them. And Stephen you know, as, as a little concerned, he says, you know, look, we've just finally gotten here. We've been through so much. You know, aren't you concerned the men might become discontented and, in his words, rush violently from the ship? And Jack says, well, <laughs> they know the ship has to be repaired in time to catch the monsoon. And in, in O'Brien's words, and they know they are in the Navy. They have chosen their cake and must lie on it. And Stephen says, you mean they cannot have their bed and eat it, too? No. No, it's not quite that, neither. I mean, I wish you would not confuse my mind, Stephen. So a delightful set of, uh, you know, an Aubreyism and Stephen just having a little fun at Jack's expense here. Ah, familiar. But uh, Did we come up with this one when we did our list of Aubreyisms, uh, the bicentenary phone-in? I can't remember. I can't Anyhow. remember either. Love it. <laughs> I love it. Jack, as you say, Mike, is absolutely on fire to get hold of all the supplies that he can get in the harbour. He knows there are two other ships coming in that might sneak ahead of him in the queue, so he wants to make use of all that he can as quickly as he can. He knows as well that in the longer term, if they don't get to Kampong soon, they'll have to beat against headwinds coming back. They'll lose months of opportunities for active warfare and prize-taking opportunities. Worst of all, heaven forbid, the present war might end before they even get back, and where would we all be then? All right. Meanwhile, as Jack is in this furious activity of refitting, Stephen excuses himself to go ashore. He wants to go and see his patients. He wants to work with the envoy who's recovering with the governor of Bombay. And Jack says, well, you're not going to want to miss the Sheer Hulk. The Sheer Hulk getting out their lower mass, he says, it's going to be the prettiest thing. Um, This doesn't detain Stephen for very long, though, right? No, no, no. He disappears on the shore, but he's seen visiting the ship from time to time with various unusual guests, which include a mathematical Parsi, you know, somebody who's a Zoroastrianism sect. Uh, so very unusual, uh, deep religious affiliation here. A child who O'Brien writes is of an unknown race who had saved Stephen from being trampled and talked to him in Urdu as O'Brien calls it, adapted to the meanest understanding. So really, you know, kind of talking to Stephen like he's a child. There's a Chinese master mariner, a spoiled priest, a Christian from Macau, Mm. quite the litany of folks, some of which we'll hear about some more. And he is rarely at his shared lodgings with Jack. 
He wanders the city, meets countless nationalities, countless faiths. He sleeps wherever he feels himself fatigued at the end of the day. He's visiting temples, pagodas, churches, mosques, Hindu funeral pyres, and he wears all forms of dress from, you know, European dress to a simple towel around his middle, but always has, O'Brien tells us, an expression of tireless, secret delight. He's become such a, a man on the scene with his pale eyes that many of the people he passes think he's a holy man and press offerings into his hands. He's having quite the experience here. O'Brien's introducing some important ideas and one important person very, very gently, at kind of half a, half a step removed here. We'll hear more about the child, the Urdu-speaking child in a second. But this child stopped him from being trampled, and in particular from being trampled among the blue buffaloes of the Angier Maidan, in danger of being trampled there. And I've just always floated past this phrase, not really needing to dig very hard into what is a Maidan and why would there have been one named after Angier. So we don't know exactly what this place was, but we knew that, that it was a Maidan. And a Maidan is an open area, like a somewhere between a clearing and a city park in the middle of Bombay. Bombay is particularly, or Mumbai as we call it now, famous for having these, these Maidans, these open areas in the south of the city. Clearly, back in the day, they were populated by herds of wild buffaloes, these days, they're mostly populated by people practicing cricket. If you go online and look for any pictures of any of the Maidans in Bombay, they're mostly being used either informally or even formally by cricket clubs and cricket teams and little cricket coaching circles that are going on there. There isn't one these days named after Angier. If they're named after people these days, they, the Maidans of South Bombay are named after either uh, Hindu deities or or famous Indian famous Indians like Gandhi uh, and, and some of the other kind of great characters of Bombay. Angier was the name of one of the governors of Bombay. Gerald Angier was the second governor of Bombay. He was appointed governor by the East India Company back in 1669. So he was definitely a, a couple of centuries before the time that we're talking about here. He was the person responsible for establishing the first court of Bombay and also for lots of the fortifications around what is called the Pale, the kind of old European colonial heart mm. of the city. Um, he was the brother of Lord Angier of Longford. So he was another Irish aristocrat. So he's kind of, you know, s solidly an O'Brien-ish character and he's part of an Irish aristocratic family. His name as a, a part of the colonial power, not surprisingly, probably erased from place names that you'll find around uh, Bombay these days. But that was where we were, and that's what we were talking about. So we have this rescue of Stephen by this child, and we switch now into Stephen's own description to his journal of his experience of finding his way around Bombay. He says it's much more than the wonders that he'd expected. It's a very worldly city, but he had no idea that it would have, or that there could be such a, what he called a ubiquitous sense of the holy no notion of how another world can permeate the secular. Filth, stench, disease, gross superstition, extreme poverty, promiscuous universal defecation do not affect it, nor do they affect my sense of the humanity with which I am surrounded. And Mike, as you say, he's amazed not just about the diversity of peoples and cultures and religions that he finds, but at the way all of these people and their different spiritualities can coexist in what is to be honest, a bit of a dung heap. He talks about meeting a Hindu religious man, a Pramahamsa, which means a supreme soul in Hindi. He meets this guy on the steps of a Portuguese church. He's a true gymnosophist, that is to say, from an Indian sect where they wear little or no clothing. The, the, the word in Greek meaning naked sage. Stephen told this holy man that in this climate, wisdom and clothing might be inversely proportional to one another. Hmm. Fair point. The man measures Stephen's own garment and observes that there is no single wisdom. That sounds like a gracious way for the wise man to compliment Stephen. Yeah, diversity and appreciation. We, we like those. Nice. Well, Stephen is just feeling so blessed that he'd learned a little bit of this language before arriving, that he, he would have missed so much if he couldn't talk to people. And, and now we come back to that child again. He says, the dear child, Dill, 
teaches him much more, even though the language that Stephen had picked up some of, Urdu, is not her mother tongue. She speaks a different language with the older woman she lives with, a crone who'd offered to sell dill to Stephen for 12 rupees, assuring her virginity. And Stephen thinks nothing could be more virginal than this fearless creature that looks at him like he's a not very intelligent, tame animal and communicates her thoughts and views the moment they're born, you know, not only having them, but communicating them to him as if he was a child too. And, you know, she can do anything a boy can, but she is not, and and Stephen uses the French. Ian, you want to uh, give us the French here before I slaughter it? <laughs> she, she's no garçon manqué, or no, <laughs> no would-be boy. <laughs> Right, right. So in my reading, I think she's not a tomboy. Yeah, she's not yeah. just that because she spends a great deal of time mothering him. She controls his diet. She fusses him for smoking bong, cannabis for those of you out there, eating opium and wearing trousers of more than a given length. Hmm. Well, if he's already into all of those recreational pharmaceuticals, Stephen is having quite the archetypal 1970s hippie voyage of discovery in India. And, right. Yeah, I wonder how much of this O'Brien secretly envies on his travels. But Mike, what I'm really enjoying here is the appreciation of the character Dill. And readers, listeners, if you're reading along with us and this is your first time with HMS Surprise, then this is going to be quite the journey by this easily one of the most memorable characters um, and one of the most poignant characters all of, the, of all the secondary characters in Patrick O'Brien. And we get this really nice characterization of Dill. She can be bad-tempered. Um, she chases off boys who want to join the two of them. She has this great appetite, but doesn't know or doesn't realize how often she actually eats. She has very, very little in the way of worldly possessions. She owns one piece of cotton cloth that she wears in different ways for different moments. Um, she owns a black oiled stone that she somehow worships. And she kind of owns and has, kind of holds on her own behalf her virginity and the uh, the old woman that she lives with offers to sell her virginity uh, at, at a price to Stephen. The only thing that she really longs for, unless she's hungry, is a silver bangle. Lots of the other children on the street in Bombay wear these silver bangles. And putting all that together, Stephen's trying to figure out what age she might be. He thinks that she's around nine or ten. She's nearing the time when her first period might come. He's thinking then about purchasing her just so that she can remain unaware of her sex, so that she's not going to become part of their very sordid sex trade. He says that he imagines her free of the gutters and bazaars of Bombay, holy and immediately human, wise too. And he's thinking, therefore, that becoming a woman would take Dill's freedom away to quite a large extent. And that loss might well come because of the place that women have, especially lower class street women have in Bombay at that time. And he reflects a little bit on the, the fruitlessness of this. He writes in his diary, only Joshua could halt the sun. And he's talking here about the story in the Old Testament where Joshua asks God to halt the sun and moon for a day so they can fulfill scripture and defeat their enemy. And here Stephen is saying, even he can't stop time for Dill. And he's a little bit, a little bit heartbroken at that, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, Stephen knows that Dill will probably be in a brothel in a year. And, and he starts to wonder to himself, you know, would, would she really be better off as a servant? He says, washed and confined in a European house or as Stephen's pet, or could he somehow endow her? You know, he doesn't want to think, O'Brien says, of her lively young spirit sinking, vanishing in the common lot. And Stephen decides, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to Diana about this. And he says that he has what O'Brien describes as a groping notion of some unidentified common quality. So I, you know, I was fascinated by this, that, that Dill and Diana share in Stephen's mind, something that he can't name, but what he's sure is a common quality. And I think, you know, we should keep returning to this and maybe to that sea serpent. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're still reflecting on what Stephen's learned about this city and its spirituality. He says, Despite the piety of the city, he says, 
Old Adam, meaning sin- sinful man, exploitative man, still walks about. He's seen the bodies of people who have been starved, who have been clubbed, stabbed, even strangled. And he reflects that this is humanity in, in the raw. You know, in any mercantile city, he says, one man's evil is another's good. And you can think that he's imagining parallels here between life in Bombay, shocking as it is, and life in London, which in fact has its own way of being shocking. Materialism, he says, that wouldn't bother anyone in Dublin or Barcelona shocks a stranger in Bombay. So he's thinking that this all has some kind of underlying spirituality, um, which kind of makes up for the savagery of life. He's watching vultures and collecting bones for himself when he meets the mathematical Parsi that you mentioned earlier on, Mike. Yeah. The Parsi says it's forbidden to pick up bones, and they have this little dialogue. Stephen says, well, surely the bones are no longer anyone's property since the bodies were left for the vultures to carry away, and he justifies his gathering of them by saying he's a philosopher. And the Parsi guy says, I'm a philosopher of numbers, and that in turn leads Stephen to take the Parsi with him back to the surprise, where they get into discussing the mathematics of astronomy. They talk about lunars, they talk about navigation mathematics. Um, All this only once the Parsi himself has overcome his fear of visiting a British ship, because just as Bombay is alien to Stephen, the, the world of white Europeans and their ships is alien to this guy. Yeah, well, afterwards, after this visit to the ship, they drink tea in the Parsi's counting house. And Stephen is disappointed to learn that despite being a Parsi, despite, you know, a member of this, you know, kind of very obscure and interesting religious sect, the man is just, as O'Brien writes, a complacent, pragmatical, worldly fellow who's turned his ancient creed into mechanical observances of stated ceremonies and a set amount of money set aside for alms. You know, his sect hates another sect, not on any point of doctrine, but only on the way they date their era. And, and I mm. think Stephen's thinking, you know, oh my gosh, you know, come familiar. on, really? Really, this is why we, you know, split up. Like, and the man's faith has devolved into painstaking attention to business as a maritime insurer with all of the homemade rules and order of what Stephen thinks of as anybody who thinks they're an eminent mathematician or lawyer that he's met in the past. And the Farsi is currently plotting the rise in maritime premiums against the rumored movements of Lin Wah's squadron. And, and they have some, some really good intelligence on this between the Farsi and his cousin, who has a banking house closely connected with the former French settlement commissioners. Stephen's thinking, you know, I could really have learned a lot more from this man had he not been so cautious. But Stephen does learn that Mr. Canning and his retinue are returning to the city on the 17th. <laughs> so it, it, more of the kind of jeopardy here Stephen's finding tranquility and sort of a kind of fulfillment being part of the hubbub of the city but jeopardy comes from more Europeans coming from the outside Canning is on his way and there's this big Hindu ceremony coming up and Stephen's talking about it here with Dill Dill has lots of different ideas in her head borrowed from lots of different religions. She reminds me a bit of the uh, the hero in the life of Pi who's picked up different bits of all these different world religions and with kind of charming innocence is fusing them all together in her own kind of view of the spiritual world. She roasts Stephen for wearing long pants. <laughs> and she talks about the connection to, between that and, and a Muslim teaching. She calls him a weir bear, which I think means like a werewolf, but a bear. She says that he's a decayed, somehow kind of rustic demon who's strayed into the city and could fly even so with some kind of bumbling flight. Like this is a a, a belief, a, 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 a being that she's borrowed from Tibetan spirituality. However, and Stephen's thinking this, she is right in one thing, I do need guidance. He is going to need help finding his way around the city. Now he's thinking to himself, I've got until... Three weeks after the 17th, that's the time by which Jack's going to get the ship ready. He's going to be around for the arrival of Canning and Diana. He's half dreading it, or he had been dreading it when they first got to Bombay, but now he's actually impatient for it. And we've been having all of this explained to us in the chapter, mostly through the means of Stephen's diary and his journal entry. 
But now he gets interrupted in in real life, in real time, by Jack Aubrey walking in. He'd come to find Stephen, says Jack, because he's heard something that makes his blood run cold. <gasps> Villiers is coming here. Diana is coming with Canning. This is a complete surprise for Jack. And now he starts saying, I, I wish the ship was ready for sea today. I can't stand, he says. I can't stand the idea of meeting her. And Jack, in turn, is amazed to find out that Stephen knows she's already here. Stephen knows that, in fact, Diana and Canning already are in a house together here and are coming back on the 17th. And Jack very disingenuously says, well, gosh, I, I see her as dangerous, perhaps even evil. And he, Jack, is dreading the encounter for Stephen just as much as for himself. And I, I can't quite tell how straight they're being with each other here. I, I, I know that Stephen is sort of holding back in front of Jack. I think that Jack is being honest and disingenuous in the way he's talking to Stephen. But Stephen says, I'm surprised you didn't know. Everybody back in England knows that Diana and Canning are here. He'd heard about their cohabitation at every dinner, at every tea drinking, at every casual conversation with a European since he's been here. He says it's quite the gossip here in Bombay for people tired of talking about famines or wars, even more so since Canning's got the reputation of being ready to take up any challenge. And having made it clear to the society here in Bombay that, as the, as the text says, he expected their menage, he means him living, as it were, in sin with Diana, he expected that to be accepted. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, you know, O'Brien tells us that the relationship is accepted by highly placed officials who knew Diana's father and, and by those who had Indian concubines themselves, but it certainly was not accepted by the European wives. And O'Brien writes, few had much room to cast stones, but hypocrisy has never failed the English middle class in any latitude, and they flung them in plenty with delighted, shocked abandon, rocks, boulders, limited in size only by fear for their husband's advancement. Conciliating discretion had never been among Mrs. Villiers' qualities, no, and if subjects for malignant gossip had been wanting, she would have provided them by the elephant load. And I'm thinking, boy, this is this is a pretty explosive situation, it sounds like. Well, canning is often gone on business, and many households keep telescopes trained on Diana's house and write anonymous letters to Canning, keeping him informed of Diana's visitors, both imaginary and real. And while society has lamented a few deaths of highly placed soldiers and officials, duels, or what they call murder by consent, were passed over as an amiable weakness, the natural consequence of the heat. And Mr. Canning is of a jealous disposition. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Boy, ratcheting, ratcheting, ratcheting. <laughs> Babington now, just speaking of people who might inspire jealousy. <laughs> Babington interrupts them. This, this is the kind of person that uh, people have in mind when they think of the conduct of a... Uh, a highly sexed European at loose in an Indian uh, in, in Indian colonial society. Babington interrupts them. He's bringing the post that's been sent by the governor. I have to hurry, he says, as as Jack kind of walks off with the mailbag. And Stephen just happens to say, "Oh, you're you're going to see your strumpet then." And Babington's very offended by this. She's no strumpet, he says. She's a clergyman's daughter. Well, why in that case? asks Stephen. Are you borrowing? money and we, we get the story about how Stephen tells Babington that clergymen are not all they seem and therefore their daughters are not all that they seem and reminds Babington of the consequences of syphilis in pretty gruesome terms how should you like he says how should you like to see your grandson bald stunted and gibbering toothless and decrepit before the age of 12 I beg you to take care any woman is a source of great potential danger to a sailor man Babington assures the doctor that he'll take care and adds, perhaps secretly peering back at them through the window. But do you know, sir, it's the most ridiculous thing I seem to have come out without any money in my pocket. <laughs> and I love the fact that Stephen rolls his eyes and, and I think it's implied that he doles out some cash to Babington anyway. And it kind of feels like S Stephen can't do anything to avoid the clash that's coming that involves him and Canning and therefore maybe also involves Jack. Um, all of them driven in different ways by their brooding sexuality. And this particular 
dalliant by Babington is something that he just has to kind of roll his eyes and live with. So he's handing out some cash. Anyway, this comes all on the back of this reflection about spirituality, about religion, about clergymen, about holy men of both the Hindu kind and the Christian kind. Yeah, of, of, of all kinds of faith. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Well, Stephen reads through his letters, the letters that arrive. You know, Sir Joseph is asking for beetles and then cleverly gives Stephen the key to another uh, seemingly simple letter from Mr. Waring in, in kind of a, a P.S. to his letter, you know, one that didn't make much sense. But then when, when Stephen sees Waring's letter, it's like, ah, okay, now I realize that this other letter, which, you know, seemed innocuous about some family feud, is actually about you know, the present situation with Catalan independence, the missteps of the British military intelligence backing the wrong horse, and their longing for Stephen's return as soon as possible. And in another letter from his private agent, Stephen learns that Mrs. Canning, Canning's wife, is now on a ship coming to confront Canning when he's in Calcutta next, right before the rains start. So... You know, Stephen's kind of gathering, gathering intelligence. Things are heating up here. But he has some other letters that he's really struggling to make sense of. Yeah, you, you would think that regular domestic correspondence would be perfectly okay. But no, this is a real challenge. Stephen's got three letters from Sophie. She's only dated them by adding the day of the week at the top of the page. And he has to figure this all out because they're all out of sequence. Um, first of all, he turns a page and learns that Cecilia, Sophie's sister, is expecting a baby in Maturin's words to himself here, without any apparent sacrifice of her maidenhead or adverse comment from her friends. And at the same time, Francis, we learn, the other sister, is far away, shivering with a woman he's never heard of, awaiting the return of a man that he's never heard of either. And he gradually reorders the letters and figures out what's gone on. Both the sisters have been married, indeed. Cecilia to a soldier who had done something very very fancy and in a great hurry to break wear down mrs williams mother williams's resistance had undermined her citadel as the letter says and francis on the other hand had been married to the soldier's cousin somebody by the name of sir oliver a rich dreary older man and mrs williams had been obliged to yield on all fronts to, to give in for cecilia's hasty wedding but had dug in her heels and had a complete victory, financially speaking, over Sir Oliver's attorney. So he's, she's managed to secure some generous provision here for Francis. Well done, Mrs. Williams. Now the two girls are gone. Mrs. Williams has dismissed some servants. She's on a bit of an economy drive. She's shut up the tower wing. She's not entertaining. The only visitor is our old friend and Jack's potential rival in love here, Parson Hinksy. And now... Mrs. Williams can turn all of her powers to the persecution of poor old Sophie. And this is a really sad story that we're hearing about here. Right. Well, Sophie writes that even though she hears about him all the time from her mother, Mr. Hinksy really is a comfort to her. He's a good, friendly man, not a bad preacher. He's kind to Sophia and to Mrs. Williams, even when she says Mama is not discreet. And he's a dutiful son, which makes Sophie feel ashamed about her lack of duty as she sees it to her mother. And Stephen's most concerned where Sophie has written that she finds it strange that Jack has not written to her. And Stephen thinks, in O'Brien's words, why, you fat-headed girl, cannot you see that a man of war must outfly the swiftest post? And Sophie writes that she knows Jack would not do anything unkind on purpose, but that she understands he has a great deal to do. And in the words of the old saying, distance and salt water do away with other feelings. Mm. She understands that Jack might grow tired of an ignorant country girl like herself. She doesn't want to hold back his career. She understands that St. Vincent didn't want officers to be married. And she doesn't want to stand in the way of any friends he might have in India. Ooh. She doesn't want him to feel bound or in any way entangled. And I think Stephen is really thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on here a little bit? And and kind of goes back through them again to see where did the, the tone, the spelling, the intensity in these letters change? Ah, I have it. Right. Uh, it, it was Jack's father. God bless him. General Aubrey, who had showed up along with Jack's new stepmother, who's the jolly, rather vulgar, young former dairymaid, 
um, that is now married to General Aubrey. They had brought their son, a badly behaved boy. They had visited Mapes to hang out with the Williams family. Stephen knows that Sophie had never met anybody quite like General Aubrey. Very old-fashioned, very coarse. Um, she wouldn't know what to make of him. And he had come up with things like a comment that she should not mind that Jack is such a sad dog his mother never had minded. Sophia would not mind, get this, Sophia should not mind half a dozen love children running around. Jack never had a groat of his own. All the Aubreys were unlucky with money. And this is just horrible for her to hear. Ne never mind that it's a completely false view that Aubrey has of his son. He's coming across, as the, the, as the letter says, a coarse, licentious, rakish, unprincipled caricature of his son and was glad that her mother, Mrs. Williams, wasn't there to witness General Aubrey's conduct at first hand. So when she finally got all these Aubreys out of the house and gone after dinner and her mother finally ar arrived, there had been cries, tears, swooning, extreme pallor and reproaches, and these all started immediately turning solely upon the poor, shattered Sophie. And Stephen can tell from the tone and the content of the letters that Sophie's feeling a bit down. She's lost hope. She's lost a bit of courage. And that's the thing that Stephen and Jack both really admire about her. And now, Mike, we get to hear this episode told from Jack's point of view because he's been reading his mail too. Right, right. He walks in saying to Stephen that Sophie is writing the damnedest things that he should feel himself free. And, and Jack's saying, you know, free to do what? He says, if it wasn't Sophie, I'd think there was another man involved. And he asked Stephen what the devil it could mean. And Stephen writes, and I'll, I'll just read this from the text. It may be that someone has fabricated. Uh, it may be that someone has told her that you have come to India to see Diana Villers, said Stephen, hiding his face with shame as he spoke. This was a direct attempt at keeping them apart for his own purposes, partly for his own purposes. It was wholly uncanned, of course, and he had never been uncanned with Jack before. It filled him with anger, but still he went on. Or that you might see her here. Wow. Whoa. You know, Ian, I, th I think like you said before, I think Jack and Stephen have to tiptoe around Diana, given what a source of contention she's been. Well, Jack didn't realize that it was common knowledge in England or that Mother Williams knew that Villers was here, where they were going to be. And Jack says, oh, isn't this just like Sophia, you know, from clue to earring, he says. You know, he thinks that Sophia is just being sweet. He, she's not chastising him, despite all this stuff that her mother is telling her. You know, if anything, she's kind of, you know, being just so kind and generous to him. And, and Jack says, as if anyone could look at Diana after, oh, however, he said, recollecting himself and looking deprecatingly at Stephen, I, I didn't mean to say anything wrong or uncivil, but, but not a reproach, not an unkind word in the whole letter. Lord Stephen, how I love that girl. His bright blue eyes, O'Brien writes, clouded, ran over, and he wiped them with his sleeve. Oh, oh. No, so, so I think I think Jack's being a little bit when Jack was saying, you know, about to himself, Diet is evil and he really dreads this meeting more for Stephen than himself. Maybe, maybe this is true. Maybe he's actually thinking, you know, I'm done with her, but you know, I'm afraid Stephen's gonna get sucked in here. So fascinating. Yeah. And he's thinking, as he's reflecting on how much he misses Sophie, that it must be harder for her with Cecilia and Frankie married and gone away. And that's a reason for him to, to vow to himself he's going to finish the refit and get back home as quickly as he can. If only he thinks to himself they could pick up a prize to clear the last of his debt, he could then invite Sophie to come out to Madeira, despite her mother, and set the two of them up in a neat little cottage. And he extols the virtues of neat little cottages and cottage gardens. Stephen says, off you go then. Write to her straight away. Prize or no prize. Jack even so, doesn't want to be called a fortune hunter, least of all by Mrs. Williams. And he says, well, these things are seen differently in Ireland. And then as soon as he's brought that phrase out, he realizes he's been laid by the Lee again. And he comes out with this French phrase that he tries to use to describe how things are seen differently. Autre pays, autre merde. And 
we'll come back to that in a second. But meanwhile, the conversation wraps up with Jack saying, Sophie has sworn not to marry without her mother's consent and there's no use. So when he talks about the difference between Ireland and England, he's talking about autre pays, autre merde. It's a, it's a delicious French Aubreyism. Literally means other countries, other shit. <laughs> and what he perhaps meant to say was autre pays, autre meurs, other countries, other customs, which is a fairly common saying. Um, you can count on Jack, though, to get it, get it wrong in the wrong way. Stephen says, if Sophie comes to Madeira, Mrs. Williams will have to give her consent, just like she had to with Cecilia and the soldier. He's kind of encouraging Jack to stick to his guns here. Write the letter. Sophia, he says, is the beauty of the world. Jack, mate, he says, you're old. You're going to get older. You're going to get fatter. You've been knocked about. He, he says, you're no Adonis and no Fox, no flashing wit to compensate. And Mike, I, I love this reference to Fox. I, I hadn't realized this, but uh, Fox is not just lower F, fox like the animal um there was a british politician of the time known for his wit and great ugliness charles james fox who was lord of the admiralty between 1772 and 1774 so well done there are stephen says many witty moneyed adonises in england marriage is an important thing to a young woman her sisters are both married you jack are ten thousand miles away could die at any time and you're now only half a mile from diana while Sophie is back home, knowing little but what she hears from her mother. You must certainly write your letter, Jack, says Stephen. Take pen and ink. Well done, Stephen. Right, <laughs> for, right. For, for all the grimness and sadness he was contemplating and you know excitement about Diana coming, he's managed to carve out some good advice for his particular friend here. Absolutely. Well, Jack thanks Stephen for his thoughts and excuses himself to go to the naval yard where he says they're shipping the new capstan this evening. And, and Stephen is really disappointed. He's disappointed in Jack, and he's disappointed in himself. And he writes in his journal, if there'd been powder smoke in the room, a tangible enemy, Jack would not have hesitated. He would have known his mind and acted at once with intelligent deliberation. And for himself, Stephen writes that the devil took hold of him. The devil told him if Jack was vexed with Miss Williams, with Sophia, he might turn to Diana, and that Stephen already had his work cut out with him, with Mr. Canning. And he confesses in his journal, I fell at once here in, in kind of really pushing Jack hard about Diana and Sophia. Oh, man, where, where does that all leave us? I'll tell you what. And this talk of coming to Madeira, I think a glass of Madeira might be just the thing. Oh, what an excellent idea. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. M Mike, it's really great how much characterization and exposition and the, the kind of meet in this in the relationships between Jack and Sophie and Stephen and Diana all from this one short conversation over a couple of sets of letters in the cabin. And how much does O'Brien manage to pack into the smallest, the most kind of fleeting interactions between his characters here? It's really great stuff. Right, right, right. But as we said, Stephen's looking ahead. I'm not going to say looking forward to. He's looking ahead to the date of the 17th and the return of Diana to Bombay. And he goes out to this large Hindu festival right down there on the beach to pass the time. And he's watching what seems to be the whole of Bombay society gathering together and he feels in his hand the hand of dill his young friend she is smiling up at him and she points out as she has done before that he's very strangely dressed she says she almost took him for a topi waller that's hindu for a hat man meaning a european she says keep your long shirt out of the dung and she invites him to sit down and picnic on the food that she's brought and it's lovely how O'Brien gives us this stream of hectoring, mothering, feeding, sort of low-key abuse from Dill here. Nay, nay, forward, more forward. Dost not thy see thy shirt all slobbered? Oh, for shame. Where wast thou brought up? What mother bore thee? Forward. And she clearly is saying this all in Urdu, and this is him kind of understanding her carefully structured sentences for him who's clearly an ignoramus. 
She decides that she can't make him eat like a human, so she licks his shirt clean for him, sits in front of him, and feeds him in little kind of handfuls while she calls him endearing names. She calls him Maharaja, my garden of nightingales. And it is for all the world like a, 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 a cosseting mother looking after a small child. She expects him to belch on command. He can't do that. That's a disappointment. She says he has no more skill eating with his fingers than a bear and asks if he is not actually a bit of a Frank, a European all the time. Let's take a pin in Dill's reaction to Stephen's inability to eat with his fingers. We'll come back to that later here. But I, I do, uh, Ian, like you say, this idea of Dill calling him a bear, a wear bear, can't, you know, eats like a bear. It, it made me think a little bit of Dill kind of playing Stephen's role of saving Jack when Jack was the bear in Post Captain. Yeah. Now, yeah. now Stephen is the bear. Stephen is the bear. It might be a bit much, but I just, the way she is like, you know, working with Stephen, it's just amazing to me. Well, they watch the horsemen in the festival riding through, and then there's this parade of decorated elephants, some of them, you know, actually sponsored by different ships, and they've got their naval crew members on them, and still starts singing Stephen a hymn to Krishna from the Mawari people. And she continues to sing as more Europeans appear, you know, especially as the day cools off and tons more Hindus as the festival climax nears. The crowds grow very thick. The lines of carriages and bullock carts slow down in the traffic and Dill sings on. Stephen is staring at vultures wheeling in the sky, brings his eyes down and finds himself looking directly into Diana's face. Wow, she's sitting. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think I, you probably did the same thing. Staring at vultures wheeling in the skies. Oh, yeah. there's Diane. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait. But she's sitting in this horse-drawn cart with three officers, and they're stuck behind a couple of bullet carts that have run into each other and locked together. That bullet cart driver shouting at one another. It's a very nice setup because to begin with, they have to be apart. They're seeing each other. And that they can't immediately have a conversation, but it's clear that they have noticed each other. She twists around in a movement that had been forgotten from Stephen's memory, but all of a sudden became familiar again, as familiar as the beat of his heart. He thinks to himself that she's even better looking than I'd seen her last time. And I'm thinking to myself, Stephen, you've got it even worse than last time. Right. <laughs> He's got it bad. The climate of India seems to have given her this glow that she hadn't even had when she was back in England. He remembers the perfection of her movement. Nothing studied like when he'd last seen her. And as Stephen is awestruck by the appearance of Diana, Dill weighs in. What is amiss with thee? Asked Dill, breaking off and looking up at him. Nothing, said Stephen, staring still. Art sick? She cried, standing up and spreading her hands upon his heart. No, said Stephen. He smiled at her and shook his head. He was quite composed. Mm. And how much work it's taking by him to maintain that composure, I don't think we really know. We have to guess. But Diana looks over towards them and we get this really poetic idea of her scanning the crowd and her gaze goes past him and then goes back suddenly. And as the text says here, with a growing look of doubt and then the most extreme astonishment and all at once her face changed to frank delight. It flushed, turned pale. She opened the door and sprang to the ground. Great romantic moment here. She jumps down and runs towards him, leaving astonishment behind her. She ran up the slope and Stephen rising stepped over Dill and took her by her outstretched hands. Stephen, upon my soul and honour, she cried. Stephen, how glad I am to see you. I am glad to see you too, my dear, he said, grinning like a boy. But in God's name, how come you to be here? And Maturin goes on and describes it by sea, by ship, the usual way. And then the quoted speech here kind of breaks up. And O'Brien just says they continue talking. They comment on each other's appearance, how brown Stephen is, how much fairer her skin is. And they are interrupted by Dill. Diana says, who is this sweet companion? Allow me, says Stephen, to name Dill, my particular friend and guide. And Dill's having none of this sweetness of the moment here. Stephen, she says, tell the woman 
to take her foot from off my cutter. Oh, daughter, this is Diana now, conciliating Dill. Oh, daughter, I beg thou wilt forgive me, cried Diana, bending and brushing the dust off Dill's rag. Oh, how sorry I am. If it is spoilt, thou shalt have a sari made of golcan silk with two gold threads. By the way, this is all the signal that Diana is speaking Urdu, very flowery, familiar Urdu, to Dill. So she's already well at home in this place. Dill looks down at the trodden place on her ground. She said, it will pass, and added, thou dost not smell like a frank. Wow. <laughs> and I, I love the idea of her, her initial suspicion, and she's starting to be willing to let her suspicion go a little bit. M Mike, a, a phrase that you and I have used a lot in the canon here, particular friend is used here by Stephen to describe Dill, and it's probably important that O'Brien's used that phrase to describe her here. Yeah, I, I was sort of blown away by this. I mean, it, you know, even just the first three books of the canon. So let's you know forget what comes after. But in this, the phrase particular friend is used many times, but only twice is it used to mean someone other than Stephen or Jack or to characterize that particular friendship between them by others. Once it was when Jack said he wouldn't feel like, you know, being saved from drowning was a big deal unless he was saved by a particular friend who went in specifically to pull him out, which Stephen essentially did then at the end of Post Captain. Hmm. And then once, yeah, at the beginning of this book, at the beginning of HMS Surprise, it, it was talking about how the mangy green parrot was the particular friend of that insolent cat that was looking at Jack during his first inspection of HMS Surprise. So this term is not used lightly here. Dill, I think, is in very rarefied company as Stephen's particular friend. Yeah. I think, yeah, as you said, you know, this is an important character. And wow, this this really, I mean, the whole relationship got me. I wish I could, you know, put the sound out there of Patrick Tall and this exchanges between the two of them and how they sound. I just love it. And I'm also kind of taken, as you were starting to say there, thou dost not smell like a Frank. This relationship broadens out I had a, almost between the three of them. Right. Um it, it's by the way, it's a very, very strong recollection here of how the bottle of French scent was underpinning the relationship, the three-way relationship between Jack and Stephen and Diana. And now we have this particular scent underpinning the very, very different relationship between the three of Diana and Dill and Stephen. Diana wafts her handkerchief, her scented handkerchief for Dill to smell. It's an essential oil, rose petals from Northern India. Pray, take it, Dil Gudas, she said. Take it, melter of hearts, and dream of Sivaji. And we'll, we'll come back in a second to what the words mean, but it's very clearly a very poetic, generous, very flattering gift that she's kind of laying in front of Dil here. Dil can't decide quite whether to take the lovely scented hanky or not, but pleasure wins out. She takes it with a little bow and thanks her as a, as a Begum Lala, a woman of high status. And meanwhile, in the background, just in time to break the scene up, the bullock carts have been torn loose from each other. Diana has to go remount. She has to head off. Stephen, she says, should come to see her. And she starts to tell Stephen where she lives. And despite the fact that he says he knows, she decides that he needs guidance and gives directions to Dill, who also already knows the area. Dill gets these very, very detailed directions. Turn in here, go left here, go forward here, go past this landmark. And she promises Dill, if you bring Stephen tomorrow night, you'll have three wishes. Dill 100% agrees that Stephen is helpless and needs guidance, although I don't think the two of them mean the same thing when they talk about guidance. Diana returns to the carriage and is gone. And what a scene that was. Really, really beautiful moment. Um, Sivaji, that Dill is going to dream of as she breathes in this scent, um, that's the name for Shiva, Shiva, the Hindu great god, whose name in Sanskrit means happiness or prosperity. And interestingly, um, we've talked a lot about the themes of dis creation and destruction. We had that with uh, um, the Ouroboros, the, the, the snake biting itself uh, last time. We've got the image of Shiva, who at shrines is often presented as a phallus, as a symbol of fertility. So I'm sure none of this is accidental in the creation that O'Brien set up for us here. 
No, no. And as, as you're saying, you know, it, it, Shiva is this God who presides over this endless cycle of creation and destruction of, yeah. of people, you know, some people point out, and, and also of crops. So, yeah, I think we're right back at it. Well, Stephen feels Dill's unwinking scrutiny as Stephen scratches himself to calm his violently pumping heart. Oh, 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 she cried at last, rising and placing her thin hands together like a temple dancer. Oh, oh, I understand it now. She writhed and stamped and swayed, chanting, Oh, Krishna, Krishna, oh, Stephen Bador, oh, melter of hearts, ha, 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 her mirth overcame her dancing and she fell to the ground. Dost thou understand? Perhaps <laughs> not as well as thou. I shall explain, make clear, she is wooing thee. She wishes to see thee by night. Oh, shameless, ha, ha, ha. But why, when she has three husbands? Because she must have a fourth like the Tibetans. They have four husbands, and the Frank women are very like Tibetans. Strange, strange ways. The three have not given her a child, so a fourth there must be. And she has chosen thee because thou art so unlike them. She was warned in a dream, no doubt, told where to find thee, so unlike the rest. Holy, unlike, asked Stephen. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, they are fools. It is written on their foreheads, and they are rich, and thou art poor. They are young, and thou art ancient. They are handsome, red-faced men, and thou, most holy men, are hideous, though more or less innocent. <laughs> and so this, this great description. And then O'Brien tells us their their horns and trumpets starting up, so they have to run for the sea to see this festival's climax. So we, we don't hear what goes on after that, but I couldn't help but feel that Dill's description of Stephen and these other officers who she's characterizing as her three husbands, you know, uh, and Diana is not far off from the assessment that Stephen just gave Jack relative to his potential rivals for Sophie. Uh, <laughs> it's really funny. It's one of the great um, interactions between Stephen and a secondary character. And it's so short, but it really, really stays with us and the relationship and the the connection between Stephen and Dill is very, very poignantly set up with just wonderful skill here. Yes. So we have these wishes of Dill's and Stephen sees an opportunity here, partly to help her and also partly to kind of set himself free to not need her guidance and to not need her to be on the scene as he goes to meet Diana. So he walks into the alley where the silversmiths are. He doesn't want Dill to go with him to Diana's, doesn't want her to see him dressed in European clothes, doesn't want to have to deceive her about the visit because he's already worried about the, the taint of the, all the lies and the deception and the subterfuge of his intelligence work that have printed through into his personal life. And I think he was aware of that as well when he was having the conversation with Jack Aubrey earlier on. Right. He says to himself, there are some, and Diana is one, I believe, who have a separate truth of their own. Ordinary people, Sophie and myself, for example, are nothing without the ordinary truth, nothing at all. They die without it, without innocence and candor. Indeed, the very great majority kill themselves long, long before their time, live as children, grow pale as adolescents, show a flash of life in love, die in their twenties, and join the poor things that creep angry and restless about the earth. Dill is alive. And that's a very, very dark reflection. <laughs> he doesn't want to propel Dill into dying, neither physically nor metaphorically, by withholding ordinary truth. And he's, I, I think, also along the way, executing some very, very distorted special pleading for Diana, saying she has her own truth. Right. Yeah, you, you carry on believing that, Steve. Right. Well, Stephen returns, and Dill is playing a game that reminds Stephen of the hopscotch of his youth. And the text says, and he felt the stirring of that ancient anxiety as the flat stone shuffled across the lines towards paradise. <gasps> what fascinating line here. A girl with clashing anklets hops exalting to the goal. Dill, often envious of others with bracelets and anklets, you know, that she doesn't have, says the girl cheated, tells all the girls they're whores and will be barren all their lives and runs off to join Stephen here. And <laughs> Dill wants to leave for Diana's right away. You know, she's finding the notion of Stephen as a bridegroom kind of irresistibly comic. 
And Stephen says, no, I, I need you to deliver a letter to the ship for me. I, I already know the way to go tonight. And she's very upset. She says, there's no justice in the world. And if she doesn't go, she won't get her three wishes. And as you pointed out, Ian, Stephen takes a cloth parcel from his bosom and she watches intensely. She's breathless. She's motionless. O'Brien tells us as if she'd been warned in a dream. He takes out one bangle and says the first wish, two bangles, the second wish, and three bangles, the third wish. Oh. Generosity, right? Just un, uncomplicated generosity, but, but, but it's tainted with the fact that he's trying to manipulate her behavior. She's hesitant. I, I love the fact that she, I think she's always seeing there's something kind of odd about this situation here. She touches them very lightly and then it gets overtaken by joy at the gift of the bangles. Her usually fearless and cheerful expression becomes timid for a moment and she puts one of them down. She puts it on silently and is now amazed. She stares at her arm and the gleaming band of silver put on another and another and the rapture of possession seized her. She burst into wild laughter slipped them all on, all off, all on in a different order, patting them, talking to them, giving them each a name. She leapt up and spun, jerking her thin arms to make the bracelets clink. Then suddenly she dropped in front of Stephen and worshipped him for a while, patting his feet, earnest, loving thanks, broken by exclamations. How had he known? Preternatural wisdom, nothing to him, of course. Did he think them better this way around or that? Such a blaze of light. Might she have the cloth they were wrapped in? She took them off, comforting them, put them on again. How smoothly they slipped and sat there, pressed against his knee, gazing at the silver on her arms. Child, he said, the sun has set. It is the dark of the moon and we must go. Instantly, she cried. Give me the chit. She means the letter. Give me the chit. And I fly to the ship, straight to the ship. Ha ha! She ran, skipping down the hill. He watched her until she vanished in the twilight, her gleaming arms held out like wings, and the letter grasped in her mouth. End of part one of chapter seven. <laughs> wow. Mike, oh, it's 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 awesome. It's super, super poignant. And it's funny, you and I both were talking about where would we put the, uh, the the break between part one and part two of this chapter. And I was kind of reading the halfway through the chapter. I don't even know if this is halfway through the chapter, to be honest. But I thought, that is the moment. That, that's the moment, first of all, where the, the tipping point comes as we get into the second half of this chapter. And second of all, I think it's the moment that everybody wants to have in their heads as they remember Dill. Right. And, and we've got all, all of the beautiful poetry that O'Brien has been weaving all the way through this book, especially the last couple of chapters. We've got light, the gleam of the silver. We've got her physical presence kind of close and touching to Stephen. We've got the presence of birds and the metaphor of her as a bird. We had Diana juxtaposed with vultures. And now we've got her actually like, like a bird, her arms outstretched like wings. It's absolutely stunning. And I, I think you, you could easily wish, couldn't you, Mike, that the, that the chapter ended here. Oh, I, I absolutely do. I thought to myself, I wish O'Brien had just ended the chapter. I feel like I'm having this incredible meal. I can't eat another bite. I just want to savor this. I just want to savor this. I mean, we've already had so much, you know, this incredibly wonderful description of this richness and diversity of Bombay, you know, and this fascinating way of, of exploring Stephen's perspectives on all this. I, I loved that. It, it made me think about my first time yeah. in Mumbai yeah. and, and my own incredible reactions to all that. Wow. And as well as giving us empathy for Stephen and his discovery of, of Mumbai, we've got this very, very uh, deep reflection on how holiness plays out. Stephen's never been very much at all attached to organized religion in his life back in either um, France or Barcelona or uh, uh, in England. But here he's really founding a sense of a kind of spirituality that strikes uh, a chord with him. In this city teeming with life with all these different people, it's a world of gray and he's seeing the grayness that I think he instinctively knows and understands about humanity. Um, he 
sees and hears all of the kind of wishes and ideas and aspirations going on. Um, we get the idea of his aspirations for Dill. He starts to wish, and I think he knows that it's hopeless, but he wishes that he could take this amazing childish character and protect her, maybe even to the extent of preserving her somehow, keeping hold of who she is, um, reflecting on who she likely will turn into in the city where there is both all that is holy, but also all that is corrupt in his reference to old Adam. And yeah. uh, he's, you know, he's very, very conflict. I mean, it's a very true and anguished statement about parenthood, right? That on the one hand, you want to keep them as they are. But on the other hand, you know that they're going to have to kind of kind of grow and become part of the world. Yeah. And, and you, know, I, you know, I think we're just heaping on all the all the things on this meal that we've consumed so far. And, and I'm thinking, you know, and add to that, that Stephen had said in this first part that he didn't want to think of Dill's lively young spirit sinking, vanishing in the common lot. Yeah. And then we've got that combined with his delight to see that Diana's spirit is back. You know, she's not like he had seen her in London at the theater. And he's there in the midst of all this groping for what he knows but can't say is the common quality between the two of them. So mm. all of this thing about the city and the holy and the peoples and everything, all of this about Diana and about Dill. And then it just gets even better i think as as diana and dill meet oh it's great and for for a moment you think these two are going to make the best of each other and for each other diana's generosity and kind of sensuousness comes to the fore and dill's you know willingness to to protect stephen but also help foster his his kind of weird love life all of this comes up in this conversation diana talks to dill kindly and respectfully she invokes the god shiva for dill's dreams and that goes along with all the associations in, as we said, in Hindu spirituality between Shiva and happiness and prosperity and creation. There's a moment of hope there when there could be creation and happiness and getting good future prospects for all of them, and in particular, Stephen and Diana. So we, we get to hope for a minute. Maybe that hope extends to hoping for J Jack and Sophie as well, who at risk of long distance and salt water as somebody said was it nelson who said you know wash all other feelings away right right and, and it's interesting that mathematical farsi with all his inside yeah. intelligence on lenoir's squadron didn't jack just need a little break need a prize to become unstuck and right to sophie i kept thinking in my mind you know is orion setting us up here or setting this up for this to work i i don't know you know there's there's so much i guess yeah, we're kind of left here uh, thinking, okay, so Stephen is off to see Diana at night. And, and I'm thinking to myself in this kind of childish innocence, is she wooing him? Will Dill get her comic bridegroom? Wouldn't that put Jack in a bit of a pickle? Wouldn't he just love that and, and be so shocked by it? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know either, Mike. Perhaps, just like always, the best way for us to resolve all of this is to come back next week. What do you say then? to a little bit more of this fabulous Patrick O'Brien. Go oh, with all my heart. no single wisdom I'm like, no, that sounds like a, a gracious way for the wise man to complicate sorry <laughs> that sounds like a gracious way for the wise man to compliment Stephen. yeah diversity and appreciation we, we like those <laughs>